Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of 12 Million. I am Darren Jenkins. I am Akbar Majid. And we are uh, fortunate to be joined by a, uh, a director, producer, writer who, as I dig and learn more about her, I'm just like blown away. <laughs> Melissa uh, Hazlett, um, mm -hmm. producer, director, writer of the film Mr. Soul. Um, Melissa is an award-winning filmmaker based in New York whose current film, Mr. Soul, to date has received 33 nominations, won 19 awards, including 14 film festival awards. <laughs> Woo! I mean, that's a, there's a lot of goodness going on there, and we are so happy to have you with us. Thank you so much for having me. It's so wonderful to be able to chat with you guys. And yes, we are out here in the streets. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Which is the way it should be. Festival streets. <laughs> you know, it was funny because um, I actually saw Mr. Soul, the, sh the show on Amazon Prime first. I was just oh. on there kind of trolling around looking for something good to watch and came upon it. I was like, wow, this is really good. I didn't know there was a film, and then I kind of started to look at. Right. I wanted to learn more about him, and then I just start and, then, and it expanded. And I was like, "Oh, there's a film." I'm like, "That makes a total lot of sense." Um, this, That's this, so cool that you discovered it through the series first, because oh yeah, I yeah. usually I, say to people like, "This is the greatest show you've never heard of." And that then, is absolutely true. You know, kind of like reverse engineer it and try to explain what this show was and who the man is that created it. Um, but that's really great that you found the series first because the series is just a gem, you know, and yeah, to think that it was fantastic. the archives for yeah. like. It's like oh, looking yeah. at Black History Happen on, like right in front of you. Yeah. And it made me think of my mom and my father mm -hmm. thinking, Oh, this is probably what they were watching, man. This is they were watching this because I, I guarantee they were watching this. Absolutely, it was like what we call now must see TV. Mm. But at the time, there was nothing to see, you know. And so when there was a black person on television, it was like blacks on TV, black on TV, and everybody mm. would come running from wherever they were, yeah, to get to see this rare opportunity of just the black experience on television, which really wasn't welcomed during that time, you know? Mm -hmm. So like Aaron mentioned, so you're a producer, writer. Um, so where did it all start where, for you? Like, I mean, did you grow, I mean, you grew up in a household that was very educated, very cultured, very conscious. Mm -hmm. um, so, but where did it start for you? Did you always have a, a passion, a love for filmmaking or? Yes, I did, but I also really wanted to be a performer. You know, I was exposed to the arts early on. Ellis Hazel was my uncle, and he was like my spirit animal, my cultural ambassador. You know, mm. he took me to shows, he took me to Broadway. He always knew everyone, so we were going on stage, and you know, I got to see The Wiz, believe it or not. But it wasn't oh, wow. seeing The Wiz; it's let's go on stage and meet The Wiz and see the trap door where Eveline went down through and just, you know, melted into the floor. And these things just blew my mind when I was a child. Mm. Um, he exposed us to everything, you know, taking us to see Luther Vandross at Radio City mm. with the Cheryl Lynn tour, you know. Uh, and there was just so much culture that seemed so expressive and I connected with that and I connected mm. with him. And so he really encouraged me out of all the family, which wanted me to go the you know straight and narrow path, academics, lawyer, whatever. Um, and I, I just kept getting pulled to this world of the arts where I felt at home. So I started dancing, singing, and you know performing at an early age, and had a whole nother life as a career in in um, Broadway and theater myself. So that mm -hmm. kind of rich understanding of performance and the arts and and the sort of black renaissance that we were coming up after what had come up after the you know original yeah. harlem renaissance and then this sort of new age of black excellence that came through the 60s and 70s with soul and realizing that you know we had a legacy to uphold and um after a while being in the theater and being in film i realized that there was a larger stories 
to tell that I didn't see being told. And I thought, you know, there's there's there are these voices that aren't being represented long before the idea of diversity, inclusion, and equity, you know, the DEI catchphrase that we use now. Before that, it was just a lack. You know, it mm. was a dearth, if anything, of opportunities, not a lack of talent. And certainly there are plenty of hidden figures everywhere, but we just didn't have the opportunity. And it occurred to me that wouldn't it be so much more interesting to share, to get on the other side of the camera and be responsible for pushing the culture forward, just like my uncle did, you know, in the 70s. It felt like it was time to, to shift the narrative around our own agency and the importance of telling our own stories. And there, it was quite a struggle for at least a decade. Now things have changed significantly, even just from last summer. Uh, and that's, it's long overdue, you know? Mm -hmm. So it, we really need a moment right now to celebrate our greatness and our blackness and um, not necessarily be focused on, you know, all the things that have held us back, but it's really time to move forward. And I, I think we all feel that. Definitely, definitely. So your first two film projects, one, I guess you produced and directed one. I guess the first one was um, You're Dead to Me. Mm -hmm. And then the second one was what Contact High Visual History of Hip Hop. Yes, that was so you know, great for everybody. I'm a big hip hop head, huge hip hop fan. <laughs> and I'm actually working on another project on hip hop right now. Yeah. About women in hip hop. We'll, we'll talk about that later. Okay, before you can say no <laughs> word, I was I was literally was listening on Spotify to this one playlist and it was like this under like underground hip hop. And uh -huh. I would say a good half of the list were women. And I was uh -huh. just like, where is the documentary talking about that? Because exactly. there are so many amazing like rap artists, you know, DJs uh, that that are women that Mm -hmm. I was, I'm just like, damn, you know. It's a story that needs to be told. And, you know, there, there are so many stories like this, but it's so mm -hmm. important that Black women are having their say right now and demanding to take up space where we have been all along. But the contributions that Black women have made to the culture, to hip hop as well, to that culture, but all of our contributions have been overlooked or underappreciated, certainly. And it's just really exciting to have a moment to kind of counteract that narrative and take up our space and tell our stories and be our our authentic selves. And that's mm -hmm. important in, in hip hop, too. So um, it, it it's interesting that for so long, especially in hip hop, the narrative has been, you know, that it's very male dominated, male oriented, hyper, hyper masculine, and that women were just there for one or two things. <laughs> And um, I'm just really happy that that is changing now and that women mm -hmm. are finding their own strength and that these the new hot girls are taking their own lead with their sexuality and their boldness and their bravery. And um, it's really it's really invigorating to see. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'm glad somebody's taking up that 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 story, you know, to kind of tell it and um, mm -hmm. give because give, you know. You know when MTV was around, and then Video Music Box, you 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 know you got to see some of it, some of it, right? Not as much as there was, or not nearly as much as there was. Right, but it would always be a sidebar, you know. Exactly. One woman on the side. It's Queen Latifah representing right. all of us, and you know that's no, one at a time. Right, <laughs> right, right. Or who's in and the now video? There's no music video, right? I mean, there's no music video platform really anymore so you don't get, really get to see them unless they release their own videos somewhere exactly so that that you know that part of i mean that kind of kills me as far as music is concerned as overall concept anyway mm -hmm. but it, it hurts it hurts them i think even more so because we don't get those shows we don't you know your, your uncle like as i as i watched the film he, one of the things that just jumped off to me about him was he didn't, you know, like a lot of times when you get TV programming, they try to do what's politically correct or they try to do what the programming, the, um, the programmers want you to do. Yeah. 
he evenly showcased women and men and different different things, which I, you know, from a television standpoint, was kind of risky, but very risky. But, you know, you remember that the the quote unquote equality or equal footing or yes, there's still age wage gap, age gap, and and everything, but that really wasn't the case in the in the years from the 60s onward certainly not mm. before that even coming on the tail end of civil rights movement the women's liberation movement all of these movements were kind of coalescing at at a time to push the culture forward and and give everybody their space and and recognition and freedom and the opportunities that we take for granted now that I'm sitting here talking to you, even, you know, women didn't even have a voice back then and certainly not black women who were always left out of the story or left behind or, you know, all of the stereotypes that were limiting us. So it's really unusual to look back at this wonderful archive and not only appreciate it for, you know, this, gorgeous quality and that it is a nostalgia piece, but to really see the beginnings of black pride um, as seen on television. Now we've always had pride. We've always had love for each other and our communities and we've had our differences and our struggles and varying degrees of, of wealth and struggle and, you know, but to see that on television at a, at a time when representation wasn't even an opportunity, that's what's mm. remarkable, to see these people taking up space and not, and being completely unapologetically black mm. and understanding that we have a world that's complicated and wonderful and challenging and beautiful and really, really complex. And that mm. to see that all the variety of the black experience on television, that was revolutionary. Mm. You know, what I, another thing I noticed was, um, you know, when you get to like, when you talk about, you know, dance and poetry, um, usually it's associated with like a class structure, you know, like, yes. you know what I mean? Yes, like this and idea that was, culture. That culture. is very, <laughs> sorry about that. No problem. I'm going to let you start over again. Wait, let me just turn this off real quick. <laughs> <laughs> I beg your pardon. No worries. I have people trying to reach me right now. Sorry about that. I'll just turn this off because it has a new treat, a new trick. It does. It rings in the computer. Ah, <laughs> uh, nice. Totally busts you. <laughs> <I'm doing everything. laughs> okay, no, let's start so, again. Uh, yeah. No, my, you know, my, I guess my point was that you know, usually with that kind of content comes a class structure to it like yes you know poor, even even within white neighborhoods where you know poor neighbor poor poor people don't get exposed to that kind of culture what mm -hmm. i loved about him was his ability to to think not think of a class structure and to just imagine like this this guy sitting in the audience who just yeah. got off work from cleaning dishes and came exactly. here to this experience and was able to expose himself to a higher form of art, I just thought was brilliant, a brilliant idea. Yeah, and, and he didn't, Ellis Hayslip didn't sort of segregate the right. art in terms of one thing being more high culture or low culture. All of it was representative of black culture, the sacred mm. and the profane. You know, mm. the, the rituals of church and the spirituality and, and all kinds of spirituals and, you know, gospel choirs, but also extraordinary spoken word and Nikki Giovanni, the last poets, the, the mm. importance of all of these clashes and all of these pieces of the quilt that make up the fabric of our culture across the diaspora. You know, we are not a monolith and, and, right. and Ellis welcomed all of those different sides of the equation and of the conversation because that's more representative of who we are. And right. to have these sort of iconoclastic moments between, let's say, Nikki Giovanni and James Baldwin, and that they oh, can God. still find community yeah. in being black writers, in being representing the black culture, black love, black strength, black sister and brotherhood, you know, mm. black, black descent, 
right. as well as agreement and that you can see all of that taking place on the same stage. Mm. I think that was really refreshing and surprising and very mm. bold, very, very brave um, mm. to take a chance at really having a full spectrum of the black experience and, and not trying to codify, you know, or, uh, you know, this idea of giving value to one thing over the other, you know, who's to say that modern dance isn't as important as ballet. And that's right. why we have, we were able to support Alvin Ailey and also, you know, Dance Theater of Harlem. But this was fighting against a culture, a, a more dominant culture that was saying black dance isn't art or hot right. or, you know, black expression isn't worthwhile. And so this sort of ascribing value to black culture was the fight that he was constantly in to say, mm. we're not here <laughs> to be patronized or to be judged or to be qualified or mm. quantified. This is the full black experience and we welcome you to share and enjoy it, but we're really not here for you. We're here for mm. ourselves and we're mm. not here to entertain you, which is what black culture was really you know, dominant for in, back right. in the day. So it was really an independent shift away from an outside de definition of self mm -hmm. and encouraging African-Americans to see this new moment of, you know, really trying to understand and redefine ourselves on this new black American landscape. Mm -hmm. So, so how long did it take you to put this together? Right. So I know oh, it took a minute. <laughs> it took a while, right? grew up in, you know, in this, right? And being a part of this, you know, on a daily basis. But what inspired you to say, you know, this deserves mm -hmm. its own documentary, right? It's, its own yeah. piece. What, what inspired you? A couple of things, actually. Number one, I'm always attracted to um, ordinary people doing extraordinary things. And sometimes it's those people that you don't see who are really shifting and pushing the culture forward, or it's the underdog story or the fish out of water story and the ripple effects that can happen when you have a visionary who believes and loves his people. Mm -hmm. That to me was a remarkable story and that you had this kind of unsung hero in Ellis Hazlip. And you also have now in our point of view, you know, 50 years later, this kind of show that somehow got lost or that was mm. abandoned, you know, that nobody knew about. That really is a wonderful entry point because we, we already know what happened to Stevie Wonder and Earth, Wind & Fire, Arsenio Hall. And yeah. so, but nobody has really thought about that origin story and that we mm. do have an origin story and that we're not just here because of enslavement or here to be defined by others you know that we are innately beautiful innately powerful and innately expressive and to see the naissance of of black critical thought and beautiful poetry and expression and the freedom of expression and and um it, it was just mind-blowing to me and then i was thinking ahead that so many of these African-American icons of the 20th century were becoming mature and that we would lose them soon, you know, and we wouldn't have their stories to tell. And so it was a combination of trying to illuminate the life and work of Ellis Hayslip and really explore this critical moment of uh, black power and, and expressionism and try to use that to see how far we've come, how far we have yet to go, um, to understand and celebrate our blackness and to really give us a reason to, you know, to, to just see our greatness. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we, we're, we're living in a moment that is so fraught. And especially now, uh, after the pandemic and, you know, rest, or, rest in peace, all the souls that we've lost. But we've, we have all emerged from a great struggle. And it's so similar to the struggles of the past. It feels like we're almost reliving what happened you know, almost 50 years ago, granted mm. with another uh, large scale, um, uh, you know, medical crisis on our hands. But to me, it was really, really, really important to be able to look back to understand who we are now and to see this legacy and realize that we are all part of the legacy and we are all Afrofuturists who have to 
take this story of our people and move it forward, you know? That was really weighed heavily on me. And also the fact that it was just such a gorgeous visual um, mm -hmm. testament, like a time capsule that it was hard to imagine that nobody had, you know, that it would go unseen, that it would go unnurtured. It's really mm -hmm. important for us to tell our own stories and to find ways to uh, build our own legacy and often reimagine, but also readdress the structures of the past that have that have held us back. And I think we're finally starting to do that. And I'm hoping that this film can be like a cultural, um, like resetting the cultural narrative in a way, because you get to see mm. how fabulous and gorgeous and wonderful and, and brave we were. And, you know, we need real voices like that now. We need heroes like that right now. And we need to see ourselves in that right now. Um. It's, you know, it's funny, you know, watching this, um, you know, my mom passed away some years ago, but, mm. you know, as, you know, when she left and we had to go through her things and stuff, so we would discover sad. all these, like, these treasures yeah. from the, that we didn't know about, like pictures with her and um, Cicely Tyson oh, and, yes. and, um, um, Andrew, Andrew Jackson, I mean, Andrew, um, um, Jack, Andrew Young, Jackson? Andrew Young, Andrew Young, sorry, yeah. yes. uh -huh. brain fart, um, and, you know, all these different celebrities, and, and I'm just like, what, wait, what, who yeah. is my mom? But, <laughs> what is your but, life? <laughs> yeah, I'm like, I, I'm just, it just blows me away, so many people, but I, I think, you know, that was because, that it was it was just different where how you and like when you connected with another person during that time it was much more personal it meant more it was you know it, it was it was about being black it was not about hey um i need this job can you hook me up uh, hey man um you know I, i'm looking to raise money for my business can you hook me up it was about sharing like bonding over the experience of being a black person in that yeah. time and you know we were also part of a larger movement at that time mm. it felt like we had been a little bit fractured until the galvanizing moment of you know our dear george floyd's untimely death and mm. brianna taylor ahmaud aubrey and and we the 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 ripple effect of that sort of cultural uh uprising and racial reckoning gave us something to realize that we had suppressed for so long but mm. 50 years ago you know it was so real because we had just not lost but the same kind of inciting incidents when you think about it you know they killed mm. medford they, they killed malcolm they killed mm. martin and mm. all all of that trauma was something that was so visceral and we were reacting to back then and in the very similar fashion but a, a modern way today right but we didn't have social media back then. We didn't have these connectors. And so what we had was each other. We had mm. our church, we had our faith, we had our blackness, but our blackness, we had to fight to feel and to be you know, determined that our, black, our blackness was beautiful. Mm. And, and so when you look at the show, Ellis Hazel was having a love affair with mm. his blackness, with our blackness. And you can see that and the audacity to be free enough to recognize that if there's so much self love there and mm. we tried to imbue this sense of love and worth in the film. And so you could feel that, that you could feel the energy coming out of the television when he says, mm. you know, if you would place your hands on the television, I, <laughs> I hope you can feel the vibrations we're giving out tonight. I hope you'll be able to deal. So that's, that incredible. Incredible. <laughs> That's my favorite line. <laughs> I, made me want to lay my hand on the TV. I was like, where's the TV? <laughs> I know. And so, you know, that, that feeling of the beauty of we all have something in common. He says, we're all black. And that's something mm. that we can understand. Mm. Imagine hearing that on national television. Yeah. You know, and that was even today. You know, you, <laughs> you, even today, I think even if, if he were to say that today on TV, I think it would still, it, I think it would resonate 
like a wave, just a shock wave going across the country. Yeah. Oh, he knew exactly what he was doing, even though he was very dapper. And of course, you know, he was a queer man, so he held himself mm. differently. And, um, but he, as, as Ellis Hayes said in, in the, as oh, it was, it was Harold Hayes says in the film, you know, he could just be so debonair sitting back and smiling and, and say, and being so nice, but he was hurling bullets. <laughs> <laughs> and I just love that line. And also, um, it, it just so evocative and makes you recognize that there's so many ways to be a revolutionary. You know, you can mm. be quiet as well. You can change perception. And, and, you know, he was in the business of changing perception of African-American culture, saying, this is beautiful. This is value. We don't need to ascribe value because it's already innately valuable. Right. And that was really empowering and uplifting at a time when it was so necessary, you know, lift every voice and sing and coming out of Selma and everything else that happened. It, it's right. just, we as a people have been reacting to trauma. Trauma is in our DNA, you know, right. through our generations since we were, since the first African was taken from the shores of Africa, you know? Right. And so we, we have this innate ability though, to be joyful. And we wanted to center the film in black joy and the awareness of the fact that yes, we do have joy as much as we have pain and as much as we have had to navigate these hardships and these, these cruelties and these deaths and loss, we have a beautiful sense of joy and a great depth of power within. And just to have that kind of encouragement, that is, that is what moves the people. That is what's powerful. You know, people don't talk enough about the power of love that the Black Panthers had. Mm. You know, the threat wasn't so much the guns as it was galvanizing people with love. Right. Love for their children, love for their communities, love for each other, you know. Mm -hmm. It's, I, and again, that just has to be redressed through another set of eyes to understand. There's a great series I've been watching that um, literally destroyed me, but right around um, a couple of weeks ago when I realized it was on, it's a series called Exterminate All the Brutes uh, by Raoul Peck, who's the same director who did the James Baldwin piece, I'm Not Your Negro. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's incredible. And what it does is it redresses, readdresses uh, this idea of um, uh, white supremacy coming all the way back, you know, going all the way back to before slavery and to the conquerors and to the colonialism and this false narrative that was set up that way mm. and how that has impacted all the people of color uh, and the extermination of people of color in this country wow. it is mind blowing <laughs> and wow. it's just another perspective and we so often again talking about critical race theory in school right now we don't have the diversity of eyes through which we're being taught through which we're seeing media, all of that needs to change. The structure mm. around how we're learning and, and what we're seeing. So that's that's the importance of telling black stories, you know, through a black lens with mm. all kind of experience and lived experience and authority and not, you know, somebody watching from afar. Mm. So yeah, if you get a chance, check it out, but be ready and have that Kleenex ready. <laughs> I think that's very important, right? Is yeah. Telling our own stories and, and understanding our own value. In that. Yeah. Um, and how much black joy is necessary. It's right up there with self-care. You know, these are words we toss around so freely right now, but mm. it's really very important. And it, it's, that's what's inspiring me to make the work I'm making right now, centering black joy uh, and, and, and uplifting BIPOC stories. Because it's it's just time. It's really time that we nurture ourselves as well. You know, it's important. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so being black is important. Yeah, yeah. For those of you who just joined us, you're listening to 12 Million. And our special guest today is Melissa Hayslip, director, writer, producer, director of film Mr. Soul. So yeah. one of your other interviews, I heard you say that 
this film is a love letter to black culture. So the kind of continuation of the, the piece about love. Um, can you expound on that? A little Absolutely. Bit? You know, there are so many times when when you look at media and you look at the way we have been depicted, there's again, a lot of trauma, a lot of um, beautiful stories that are very sad stories where you see horrible things happening to black people. And it's very difficult at this point to keep sort of imbibing this narrative mm. over and over and over that we have to be beaten and broken and discriminated against and and you know that the 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 breakdown of the culture and what it's doing to the black body that is debilitating and mm. i thought it was just really important to show that there is so much love that we have for ourselves and for our for our culture and when you pull it all together to see, sometimes you just have to find a way to frame it. And one thing we wanted to show was that this burgeoning black experience and uh, black individuality and not exceptionalism, but really community building and, and um, institution building, which was very important to Ellis Hazlett, black institution building, mm -hmm. that this was in response to so much degradation and so much um, difficulty in our lives that we wanted a chance to share just the beauty of blackness and mm -hmm. the love we have for ourselves and for each other. And so when you sort of cumulatively look at this work, it's one thing to be really nostalgic and love the Afros and the high heel shoes and the great songs that we grew up in, but it's there's something else that you see there you see this truth and this resilience and this mm. inescapable black pride and black love. And why not have a Valentine to that? You know, why not have a love letter to us? Because we deserve it. And I really felt it was time to make a film that way, that was mm. positive, uh, uplifting, um, inspirational. Intellectual intellectual as well, and really spoke to the interiority of blackness. We don't see that a lot. And, you know, we see the representation on the outside. We see everybody, you know, looking fly and on, on Instagram, you know, blinged out and everybody has the grills and, and all the designer goods and that's fantastic. Uh, you know, but that hip hop also is a very aspirational culture, but there is this inner beauty and this inner truth as well. And when you see the expression of black lives and black culture coming through these artists, you realize that we have been doing this for years, mm -hmm. generations even, and how important that is. And yes, you see the last poets who are the grandfathers of hip hop, right? Mm -hmm. And you see, you start to put the, le the string of the legacy together and you see that black seeds keep on growing. And that was a theme in the film as well. So we just really wanted to show that and um, to be a light and to show the light that we have and so it, to inspire us to keep going. And mm -hmm. uh, you know, this legacy of soul and this idea of Ellis Hazel really was like a Afrofuturist and he mm -hmm. saw the betterment of our people and he always wanted the better thing or the better opportunity, the better gig, the better outfit, whatever it was, the better platform for our artists and pushing them forward. Oh wait, what's this? We can't have black black people in Lincoln Center. Well, let's change that. Let's mm. have Soul at the Center, which he produced, which was taking all of the artists who had been on television and doing, believe it or not, the first collaboration between Lincoln Center and the black community. Mm. Okay? The first time we were kind of allowed in these hallowed spaces. And he created a two week Black Arts Festival that happened two years in a row. And some of the artists were even bigger than the ones you saw on television who needed a bigger wow. audience. Like one year it was opened by Ike and Tina Turner. Ooh. And then the next year it was opened by Nina Simone. I mean, it was just amazing. Wow. And this idea that we deserve to be here and take up space in these hallowed halls like Lincoln Center. And we deserve to be ourselves as well. 
We don't have to fit in. We're not a minority of a larger nation. We are a nation. We are a nation of people. And that's mm. a really important line that Amiri Baraka says in the film. You know, we realize that we are a nation of people responding to the times. Mm. There's another interesting quote that it, it kind of goes along with that in, in the film that says, we have the best of everything if we aren't thinking about money. Oh, yes. I love that. Yeah. That is such a great line. And that was, um, by the way, all the lines in the film that you hear voiced by the wonderful Blair Underwood as the voice of Ellis Hazlip. Mm. Uh, I took all of those. Those are all verbatim quotes from um, hundreds, if you will, of articles, um, New York Times interviews, magazines, um, journal entries, anything I could find. You know, we didn't have social. He didn't have social media then. So anytime he got a chance to speak his truth to power, he would. And it was really funny to you could tell the tone if he was talking to like a, the black press, like if it was Jet or Ebony, <laughs> <laughs> or if it was, you know, speaking on his platitudes for the New York Times, demanding equal this and equal that. And um, mm. so that particular uh, clip, uh, I'm sorry, it was a particular quote rather, was from an article he did with Essence in 1972. And mm. he was talking about his childhood and how encouraging it was you know most people think oh segregated washington dc in 1929 uh, to 1939 what a terrible thing and he was like no actually we had the best of everything because we had we had the insulation of the love of our culture we had our church we had our concerts at the howard theater we had howard university and we had this beautiful impenetrable community of love mm -hmm. and family and as long as you weren't thinking about money, you could be completely satisfied with everything you had, which is a, a great analogy for, you know, the fact that we have everything we need inside and we don't need to be validated by others, especially mm. culturally and spiritually. It's so appropriate even for today. Yeah, yeah. very appropriate. Right? Is it like if we really, you know, separate the money part of it, we really do have everything we need. So Yeah, yeah. And then we could have the wherewithal to say that when he's even being nostalgic looking back at his childhood at, which was a difficult childhood you can imagine like, you mm. know Washington DC in, in the 20s but um growing up in Deanwood uh, which is the same park right around the corner from um uh from Marvin Gaye and mm. just being a part of that really tight-knit community where all the families had houses down the street it was part of the great mi migration coming up from North Carolina and, and the south and everyone was, they were strivers, you know, striving to make a better way, striving to make a way out of no way. And it's just mm. so inspiring when I go back to DC now and walk those same streets that he walked and go to the National Museum of African American History and Culture. Mm. Um, it's, it's reaffirming to see the journey of a people, this in incredible arrival that we have into our greatness, you know, in spite of, it's always mm. in spite of, and in addition to, <laughs> mm. you know, all of the, the hardships that we have endured as a people. And so when mm. one person makes it, we all make it. And I think Ellis knew that. And he knew that, you know, if, if one artist could make it, if he puts this kid on TV doing magic tricks, well, that kid happened to be Arsenio Hall, <laughs> you know, at the age of 16. And he saw something in Arsenio, just like he saw something in Earth, Wind and & Fire and gave them their first television appearance. Yeah. He saw something in Al Green. He saw something in Ashford and Simpson and this generosity of pushing them forward to their greatness. That is just, you know, I'm getting choked up just, you know, trying to express yeah. it. It's really special. And it yeah. is something that we do because we don't tear down. We, we tear down each other only when things are really hard for us, you know, but we are yeah. people that we live and we love. Yeah. Yeah. Um, why do you think, like, it's funny. It's so the end of the movie mm -hmm. was my favorite. Oh. It, it was absolutely my favorite because because it made me think the most about his intention because yeah. at the end of the movie, mm -hmm. they, they run out of money. Mm -hmm. He's like, he's like, it is what it is. 
and drops the mic and walks off the stage. Yes. And but everybody else around him is like, "Are you crazy? What are you doing?" Yeah. But he, it's it's almost mind blowing. Like I'm still thinking about this. This this is I'm trying to understand it in the sense that it was it was one of the most brilliant moves I have ever seen a person take with enough bravery to kind of to say that if this is the way it is, then this is the way it is. Mm -hmm. And it was almost the best way to do it because it's, to me, it's kind of like, um, it's kind of like a, 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 like a trilogy, right? You either get a movie where the first movie is great and you just leave it there. Right. You add two or three more films on and you wear it out and it's not as the other ones aren't as good as the first one. Sometimes it's good to just let that piece of work stand to itself. Yeah. And I, for him to have thought about this, I just, I don't even know. I just I think, don't know. You know, and I love, yeah, love, I, I love what you said because I think it really does speak to two things. You know, he was mm. always walking this duality of seeing a greater world as an Afrofuturist, seeing a better place for all of us. But right. also dealing with what was what he had at hand, right? Knowing that one thing we don't explore in the film too much because it, it just wouldn't make sense uh, in the structural narrative and the arc of the story we're telling was that that show was canceled the first year. Mm. We had to fight to get it on to back on the air after the first thirty nine mm. episodes, even though it was phenomenal. It was canceled after the second year. He had to fight, 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 and demand and, and raise more money and get more grants. It was canceled after the third year and the fourth mm. year. Wow. And then finally the fifth year, that's when it started trickling down from the established uh, from the right. uh, you know from the higher ups there uh, on the national scale, you know, mm. that we had this villain named Nixon, similar to a villain we just kicked out of the of mm. the old world. Very and um, and and really having a problem with you know uh, radical um, independent thinking um, mm. and black radical thought and mm. especially and An so we have thought. someone who sees the future he also knows that where we are right now folks aren't even ready for it you know and right. so the idea was I know I can't go any further so rather than going out with my tail between my legs and trying to, you know, one thing also we didn't talk about in the film was that they had asked him to integrate the show. Oh, and, really? and, and it was contingent upon him integrating the show in order oh. to continue. And yeah, he was like, fun. well, we're integrating the network. So what? <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's no black people on PBS anywhere anyway, except right. for black journal, the one other show that existed at the right. end, you know, so he was like, why should I have to integrate my show when we're already integrating television? Right. Well, why should I have to lower my standards and the expectations of our people? Again, right. we're not here to please you. We're doing this for us by us. Mm. And that mentality has always won. And he wanted to go out winning. And so he literally spent the entire budget that last season. <laughs> you can see the, the show getting better and better. The guests yeah. becoming more and more, you know, high profile. The production value, you know, Stan yeah, the, Al Lathan Green one was just amazing. Oh my God. Stan Lathan is directing all the best shows. He's directing the Stevie Wonder show, the Al Green show, the Earth, Wind, and Fire show. It's just through the roof fabulous. And so I think it was almost as if he was saying, okay, okay, watch this. Look, yeah. look what you're going to miss, in other words. Look what mm. you can't handle. We're going to give mm. it all to you. And mm. And I think he just wasn't willing to compromise those standards. And he knew, you know, there's this one line that is so poignant in the film. Every time I see it, um, it makes me cry. It, when he says, you know, sometimes it's necessary in the evolution of things to disappear. I, I yeah, that caught me for, a, I was like, that's right? the- Those are his actual words, verbatim, from an article that I saw when it was in Jet Magazine mm. and was talking about how frustrated he was that they couldn't see the value. Again, this question of value, right? Mm. They couldn't see the value of soul. They couldn't see the value of black people. 
They couldn't mm. see the value in front of them on television with the highest ratings you could possibly get. Couldn't see the value of what it meant to the people. And they were so willing to just throw that all away. And mm. so his thought was, you know what? Sometimes it's necessary in the evolution of things to disappear. In order to recognize what you have, you have to take it away. Yep. And in that particular moment, and spoiler alert, if anyone hasn't seen the film, well, yeah, spoiler alert. <laughs> we're really. dealing with a great loss in his a tragedy in his family. That's all I'm going to mm. say. So for anyone who hasn't seen it yet, and what? so I thought, wow, this <laughs> is at the apex of you know an extraordinary professional loss and an extraordinary personal loss, both mm. of which something is being taken from him. It's disappearing, right. Right. and having to come to terms with that and struggling, you know, and realizing it's kind of like that day of, you know, the day of when black people don't do something, when we decide, oh yeah, we'll see how much you need us, you know, <laughs> the day we black out our social or the day we nobody goes to work or the day nobody shops at Target or the day mm. that nobody, you know, you won't see how much you, you're, you have until you lose it. Right. And that was a very profound thing for him to be still upstanding, still demanding respect, right. but walking away. Right. Now yeah. compare that to, you know, um, Dave Chappelle. Right. right. Similar. Yeah. yeah I, absolutely. I have a conversation with him, share the movie with him, Dave, if you're watching, you know, and <laughs> say, you know, look at the, here was this man in the height of his career and the height of black consciousness raising as a job. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and succeeding at it and yet butting heads who were not willing to allow him to win. Right. But he was already winning. Right. He was like, yeah. I'm gonna go out winning. Right. And I, I like to say it's a simplified analogy, but it's the same kind of thing with Dave Chappelle. Remember when he walked away from his show? Yeah. When he was winning. Yeah. But it wasn't was on terms, right? Yeah. And so how much did we recognize what we'd lost once he was gone? Yeah, you know, yep. I feel that way about Obama, but that's a whole other conversation. Yeah, that's a whole, yeah, yeah. We already knew what we had. When we, had Obama. <laughs> we just needed to go away to realize that. So, so let's strike that analogy. <laughs> so, the show ran from '68 to 1973, yes. and it with 130 episodes. Right? That's right. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So, I don't know how many shows are getting that now, right? No, I mean, Listen, no. especially yeah. not live shows, and that yeah. was the problem. He was, he was dealing with. Right. I mean, right. Yeah. So he was definitely you know, there. Was, and remember, there's no precedent for what he was doing. Right. Nobody had taken all of these art forms and thrown them into like a gumbo and said, here's right. a show. You know, that was not the model we knew, you know, that when you had. Well, you know, not only was it a vehicle for African-American artistry, but it was a platform for political expression and mm -hmm. a fight for social justice. Now that's everything we need right now. <laughs> what do you you think we always need forever. We always needed it. Exactly. You know, Why do you think you know, uh, Mary had a little lamb? We needed it. Exactly. You know? <laughs> but but we don't always get it. And now, especially because of other concerns, because of the FCC, because of commercialism, right. Right. unless you're on your own podcast or your own platform, you mm -hmm. know, or you're creating your own um, distribution of your work, which is which is what the most creative people have done, you know, found mm -hmm. some sort of autonomy. Um, you're beholden to these other uh, things that are limiting you. Right. you know? So and, about that, so you released this during COVID. Yes, right. <laughs> and part of the reason goes back to what we were saying earlier is that we actually, my team and I, as was the world, especially mm. all of anyone conscious was really grieving, fearful, angry, after what happened with George Floyd and yep. the movement started happening and we didn't know what we could do. And I remember people kept saying, are you okay? And getting all of my, my well-meaning friends would call and say, you know, are you all right? How are you feeling? How are you feeling? How are you getting through this? And I realized I didn't want people to ask me, how did you feel? Mm -hmm. I, I, wanted, I, yeah, I wanted them to say, you know, but what did you do? Mm -hmm. What did you do? What did you do to make a difference? Were you mm -hmm. a laptop activist? You know, were you on Twitter and Instagram? Were you in the streets? Were you risking your life with COVID to, to um, you know, fight back and throw tear gas and 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 
not riot because that's not the word, but you know, um, were you protesting? Were you in an uprising? Were you writing, acting? How are you contributing to the change that we needed to make? And I was realizing that, well, there's a power in the art. There's art as activism. That's what I want to do. And I realized, holy cow, we have this beautiful film that is so inspiring, so uplifting, so beautiful. And we, you know, after being bombarded by all the negativity that we are seeing and all the brutality and all the destruction of the black body and watching a man die that way, I realized what we can do is show this film and give and remind people of their of their greatness, you know, mm. remind black people of their greatness and give them a, a way to remember that black is beautiful, that we've always been beautiful, that it's an innate character. And mm. we thought this has such a healing quality to it and it's inspirational and it's beautiful. This would be the perfect time mm. to release it. And we didn't know what to do about that. You know, um, nobody really knew what was happening in cinema at that moment, especially with everything closing down and not knowing what the future held for the industry. So we took it upon ourselves to distribute it in virtual cinema at a time when nobody was really doing that except for a couple of festivals that have been canceled. We found this new platform and uh, you know called Eventive, which a lot of the festivals were turning to to show their films. And But our model was different. I said, now I wanna give back. Mm -hmm. I want this to be by the people, for the people and, re and because we're showing the movement all the way up to the present day in the film anyway. I, I cut in some new scenes from what was literally happening that, you know, George Floyd and a Breonna Taylor march and um, it's just really important footage that was happening even in LA. Right. And we set out to show it in three theaters. So we could also kind of qualify for any kind of awards that were coming to help get more um, awareness for the film. We didn't have a distributor. So it was totally DIY. But the idea that was different was we said, what if we partner with all of our favorite film institutions, film organizations, um, you know, uh, small theaters and boutique um, cinemas and art houses and, and, and organizations like small museums and the Studio Museum of Harlem, Schomburg Center, that kind of mm -hmm. thing. And because everybody's struggling and, and to keep their lights on and their doors are closed. So we set up all these alliances with other organizations as a, um, a, 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 a profit share. So we literally mm. split the cost of the ticket with the host of the, sh of the theater, I'm sorry, of the film, with the host mm. of the film. And what that did was we said, go out there and pick your favorite theater, the theater you would go to down the street, pick your favorite museum, pick your favorite black owned institution, uh, something, you know, Studio Museum of Harlem or, anything that you believe in and you know that you're supporting them during these dark times, help them keep the lights on and also supporting, mm -hmm. supporting a woman of color, a black filmmaker who's completely independent. And that gave agency to people. It wasn't like some money was just disappearing or going anywhere. You know, it was a different kind of community experience, a community healing. And we had a lot of big free screenings I think our biggest one was almost 1500 people. Wow. Uh, and and these were free communal events online where you couldn't do anything else but open your computer or watch the TV and we it was a great way to be together and we were we were all the chat was lit. You know, we were all in the chat <laughs> shouting like you would, you know, when your favorite person came on the screen and I'm telling you that and D nice and you know Questlove uh, you know that got us through the pandemic. It really mm. did because it was a chance to come together in spite of everything we were seeing on television and people being killed and people mm. um, in duress. It really mm. meant, meant a lot to do it at that time. So where can the film be seen now? Well, I have some good news actually. Uh -oh. As of uh -oh. today, this very day, we are announcing that we will be streaming on HBO Max. Oh, I, I know, I'm so exciting. That is so cool. So yes, we will have our streaming premiere on HBO Max on August 1st, very soon. Oh, and um, really cool. excited to bring this film to the people. You can watch it as much as you want 
And um, it's a real, it's really exciting to be on this platform because they are really committed to showing diverse voices and, and really uh, pushing for the cause now. And I'm really happy to see that in their programming, mm -hmm. especially it's very dynamic programming. They're pushing a lot of, um, of diverse content. They call it diverse content, but I call it our content. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you can binge all the Fresh Prince episodes you want. On no. Doing really dynamic new programming like the, um, the, the rendition of uh, the book uh, Between the World and Me, ta Coates. They did a beautiful yeah. exploration, sort of like essay, experimental doc kind of vibe, and I loved it. And so it's very exciting to be part of this new programming that they're doing. Um, so cool. Just announced it today. Yeah. Actually, so. I got a quick question for you. Mm -hmm. So for those people who haven't seen it, I, I cannot urge you more to watch this film. So whether you go and you pay for it or somewhere to screen it or when, if you got HBO Max, you watch it on what watch it. But my question for you was, how did you get my two favorite people, Robert Glasper and Layla Hathaway? Because it was funny. I was listening to this. I don't know. My brain just works in weird ways. I listened to this song before I saw the show. And I was like, oh, Layla's got a new song out. Okay, cool. And I'm like, oh, this is great. So I was playing at the death, and then I saw the TV show, and then I saw the film. So I kind of did it backwards. That's but great. I love that, though. How did you, how did, how did that collaboration, end, like, how did you get them on the project? I know. First of all, shout out to Robert Glasper, genius. I love him. He is my uh, favorite composer. He is extraordinary. And we wanted somebody who, obviously is extraordinary, but more importantly, understood this tapestry of music because mm. we treated the music in the film like a character. It was mm. not, you know, the evolution of the character of black music, not just as a soundtrack for our lives, but really evolving and evocative of so many movements that we've been through, personal mm. songs that mean so much, you know, really diving deep into the precise musical moments of our lives and what that represented, what it meant in terms of our own evolution. And mm. it was important to find somebody who totally understood that and who was versatile that way, who understood the roots of, of you know, gospel, who also played R&B, jazz, funk, and could just rock anything. Right. The most extraordinary um, musicians as well. I knew that he was amazing like that. And I knew that he also mm. loved to collaborate with interesting people and could bring any type of rappers or vocalists or musicians yeah. in on the job. And he certainly did that. Yes, and so his idea was to bring in Layla Hathaway for this original song mm. uh, called Show Me Your Soul. And I was just blown away because I said, well, you know, she herself represents the legacy of soul. She is the yep. first daughter of soul. as Donnie Donnie Hathaway. Hathaway daughter right but also i always knew in my mind that we would start the film with donny hathaway and so i felt that we had to end the film with layla hathaway to take us on that journey right black mm. seeds keep on growing it all was very very intentional and so i had a meeting with a music supervisor whom i had admired and was very steeped in like the grammy situation and I was looking very carefully at his work and I understood that he had just worked with um, um, Robert on a project about Miles Davis. Oh, um, I saw that the, too. That was really yeah, good. Right. It was really, really, really incredible. Don Cheadle yep. produced, directed and starred as Miles Davis. And it was not a bio, it was kind of a biopic, but was not a documentary, but I was really interested in how they were able to, recreate that music and that era so seamlessly. And mm. I wanted somebody who could understand how to build a soundtrack like that. And, you know, Robert really is a genius. Like you can tell him exactly what you want. I need a little Crusaders vibe right here. And then, and then this scene. So we, we literally composed the whole uh, film in two days in the studio wow. with no music. <laughs> That's an there incredible. was not a lead sheet in that place. I was like, who works like this? Wow. Who creates on the spot with an incredible team that's ready 
you say, I need a little bebop. I need you to go in and give me some, I need a little maiden voyage vibe here. You know, can, can I get a little bit here, but make sure you're heavy on the piano there, a little Herbie Hancock vibe or whatever. He would be like, uh-huh, mm, yeah, well, we'll do some changes. Okay, good. And then he, they go in there and knock out the song in <laughs> one take. And we're all sitting in the control room like, <laughs> if I close my eyes, am I sure that's not Ornette Coleman? Wow. They're like, wait a minute. <laughs> The wow. Crusaders in there right now? <laughs> like, it was amazing because we knew we were going to be able to license certain music, right. and then the other music we would have to create to be an underscore, but it couldn't just be an underscore. It had to mean something, and it had to be. It had to evoke the songs, especially certain songs we knew we weren't going to license, and it had to. Mm -hmm. It did all the heavy lifting because we didn't. It was hard enough that we had very disparate elements mm. oh that's not me this time no nope, but let me oh maybe it is sorry <laughs> turned it off. that's weird it rings even when it's turned off okay they're trying to get you <laughs> <laughs> let me start it over in case you can edit that out so we knew we had very disparate uh pieces to bring together and to sort of sew together for this film. So we had archival from another era that juxtaposed with really modern looking footage shot on four mm. cameras and 6K. And then we had music and then we had music from the show. And so what were we gonna use to sew all that together so it wouldn't be jarring for the audience to sort of jump in between, oh wait, this is a flashback to 1929. Right. DC. Okay, wait, now we're in the future. Okay, wait, now we're in the middle of a Black Panther moment. You right. know, it had to have like a sonic story as well, a, almost like a sonic script. And, right. and he got that incredibly. And in fact, the first time he came to see the film, we call it a watch down where I gave him all my cues. I, I had actually scored the whole film in my mind <laughs> and written out all the cues for every song that I would imagine would be in the film for each mm. moment if I had a you know trillion dollars to license them. Right. And um, I laid them all into the film so you could get the feel on the evocative moments. He sat down to watch and he had his cue sheet and he was like, uh-huh, mm-hmm, uh-huh, mm-hmm. Oh yeah, that's good. And then suddenly he jumped up and ran out the door and got grabbed his phone. And I thought, oh my gosh, you know, he must be so famous. Everyone's trying to reach Robert Glasmer, you know. <laughs> and I had strategically put all the snacks on the table. I was like, what's gonna keep him here? I just gotta make sure I got everything he needs, right? And still he ran out. So after a few minutes, I went out there like, is everything okay? Like, are you gonna have to leave? Should we stop? And he was singing. Oh. He was singing, he was composing. He was so inspired by what he saw that he was singing into the phone. He was already composing on the spot. Wow. I knew that just blew me away. And wow. he said, no, you know, I'm so, I'm so inspired by what I, from Jump, that I had to put it in my vo voice notes and just get it in there. Cause sometimes that's how he writes. He hears things and he has, he hears like a melody or a, a or a feeling that's very evocative yeah. and um, that evokes, you know, the the energy that you're trying to convey or the story or the feelings. And he just put it down. And so that's when I knew I was like, oh, it's on. It's on. Mm. <laughs> wow. And so then when he brought in Layla, you know, that was really important. Now that song had to be written very carefully uh, because it was also the lead up to the end of the film. We knew we were going to play it at the end, but he, did a lot of vignettes, sort of dropping the themes from the song leading up to that moment. So you have all of these like Easter eggs of the song, like a different variation of the song with no lyrics until mm. it rises all the way up with the end montage and then boom, you land into the song. So it, was just, really it was really incredible. I was so honored to be there as a music head and as a musician myself. And I was also one of the writers on the song. So it was mm. it was really beautiful and um, was so honored that it was short. Uh, that's how we were shortlisted for the Oscars was for best original song. Um, mm. That was a very competitive category this year. 
So I ended up in the reject yeah. pile with two John Legend songs, so I don't feel too badly. <laughs> mm. um, and I'm so happy for the people that were nominated. And of course, her, she won for mm. her from the uh, Judas and the Black Messiah, yep. her song from Judas and the Black Messiah. So it was a really strong year to be in. And it was just such an honor because the women were leading in the songs. You know, it was Janelle Monet, it was yep. her, yep. Uh, it was. Um, Mary J. Blige had a song, yeah. Christina Aguilera had a song, and yeah. then Layla Hathaway was in there. So we just felt, it was just so exciting to be a part of that moment. Mm. Even though we didn't end up advancing to the nomination, it was a real validation of the work that we had done um, and, and the importance of black music and how mm. black music tells black stories because it is who we are. Mm. And it's such a beautiful song, so. Yeah. So we're going to be releasing the song very soon. Very excited about that. We have a record deal. Oh, cool. Uh, we haven't announced that yet, but we will be announcing that very soon, probably in the next week or so. so look and listen out for that. Right? Yes, we're going to drop the song and the soundtrack will be coming very soon. So we're just Yay. going through some licensing issues right now where you can figure out what you can and can't afford. Right. Right. Um, yeah. And then we'll make the perfect soundtrack. So yes, soundtracks are back, people. Come on. Um, what I really want to do is have like a, I think it'll just be a soundtrack, maybe a Spotify, but we're going to do like a collector's album in vinyl. Oh, wow. oh that's cool. Yeah. So maybe that'll be in time I'm for gonna, Christmas. I was like, I, I actually, after I watched the film, I went up on Spotify. I was like, is there a soundtrack for this? Because I need it's to. It's coming. It's coming. <laughs> we had to get a label first. Yeah. All right. Well. And, you know, it's hard to get a label right now. As you know, you know, COVID yeah. just just pivoted we had to pivot everybody had to pivot but one yeah. of the biggest not just the music industry and artists but imagine the actual um making you know the actual fabrication of of music had stopped mm. so it was ground to a halt there were people were not in factories making records like the physicality right. of, of making records stopped so it wasn't just the industry stopping and people not being outside and not having concerts and stuff, but the whole yeah. thing. And we were worried, wow, what is that going to mean for the future of the soundtrack, for the future of vinyl, the future of music? Yeah. You know, this has really shaken everyone to the core. And yeah, well, hopefully we've learned our lesson. We've learned some things that we can kind of carry forth should something like that happen again. So, Well, I hope so. I think it's been a great time of reflection for all of us. Yeah. And, and brought us more laser focused around what we need to do, not just to, to survive, but to be kind and to understand each other. You know, there are a lot of life lessons that during this time. And mm -hmm. I feel that for those of us who were lucky enough and honored with the gift of life at this moment of great destruction mm -hmm. and death, I think it's incumbent upon us, especially as artists, to that we have been given this gift of living to tell yep. the story and to tell the story honestly and openly and beautifully. And I'm really so excited about, you know, what kind of art comes now, because there's definitely a demarcation point of what art will look like from the pandemic forward. I'm hoping yeah. it'll be a renaissance. It's certainly a renaissance for black creators because right. everyone's realizing, ah, I think we've kept them out of the picture for too long. Yep. Yeah, you have. So yep. <laughs> if ever there were a time to be a black artist, a black creative, it's now. now. And mm -hmm. we have to take that and run with it because we don't know how long those doors are going to be open. Right. But, but as long as they are, going to run yeah. right through. <laughs> There's opportunities for us to do our own stuff like you did, right? I mean, I think yeah. you know, we don't have to be so codependent on others. I mean, I think exactly. there are opportunities now for us to do our own thing. So. Yep. As you know, 12 million is inspired by the Richard Wright's book, 12 Million Black Voices. So mm -hmm. that we ask all of our guests, is there a book that you're currently reading or a book that inspired you that you would like to suggest or recommend to our listeners? I am reading several books. In fact, I have them right here. Some of them are soul related, so that's a little bit biased. That's okay. But, uh, I'll take that's them. all right. <laughs> <laughs> For those who are fans of the show, this is a great book. It's um, called... Um, it's been beautiful. Soul mm. and Black Power Television by Gail Wall, mm. oh, and you can see wow. all the notes that I've taken up there. <laughs> look, it's it's the first kind of academic um, exploration of the series, and that has come in handy. I'm oh, also wow! Okay. Um, 
the James Baldwin biography because I'm writing a piece mm. on him about him right now. And I'm kind of on the James Baldwin kick because I am actually uh, right, been doing a lot of writing and I'm writing mm. a piece on this film, I Am Not Your Negro. Oh, that was good, yeah. I'm trying to figure out which angle, yes. And then uh, lastly, I wanna share this because this is a rare book that is a direct result of the soul show. Oh. This is called James Ball and Nikki Giovanni oh. a Dialogue. Wow. What this is, is an actual transcription of the conversation that was between James Baldwin and Nikki Giovanni. That was one of my favorite episodes. Like it's I wanted to be a final one. Right? Yeah. This it was so great, you know, and they were doing several different um dialogues James Baldwin was doing at the time. Margaret Mead, I think, was a conversation, but never had he had a conversation with somebody like Nikki Giovanni. Right. And the show was so important to artists on the back. Wow. that they transcribed it and made it into a book. This oh, book so cool. is worth something like $4,000 right now, which is crazy. What? Yes, I kid you not. You can Google it. Wow. <laughs> it it's rare. You can find a paperback copy somewhere between 400 and 700. But if you see this book, y'all, grab it because it's, it's history. And it's so exciting to think that Ellis Hazlett brought these two people together in London to mm. discuss black love and strength and power and community and black authorship and the importance of all of those things. And so we do the importance of legacy keeping, even if it's a book is right here. Mm. Yeah, that was, a, that was, I saw that conversation. I was like, who doesn't want to be in that room right now? Seriously. <laughs> really incredible, really incredible. Yeah, and I'm also reading Liner Notes of the Revolution by Daphne. Uh, Daphne, oh my gosh, I have to think of her last name now. Well, read that book, Liner okay. Notes of the Revolution. <laughs> it's really wonderful. Wow. So this has been wonderful. This has been yeah. wonderful. Thank you for joining us. Yeah. Thank you for having me. It's always a pleasure to come on and talk about soul, but also thank you for your insightful leadership and all that you do to you know get get our messages out there it's really important that we have a place to celebrate each other well like i said to you in my email this you know richard oh, wright I just and remember brooks brooks brooks, yeah. daphne brooks everyone yes daphne brooks um this book uh, like you know richard wright's book and your your you know his show you know, were kind of inspirations in the mouth of, of kind of our purpose mm -hmm. for this podcast, mm -hmm. which is to kind of do positive stories with interesting individuals, yeah. the people who are, you know, doing things right. that we should know about. Yeah. And um, thank you for creating the film, first of all, um, with just a wonderful piece of black history. And, um, you know, I, whatever good things can happen to you. I hope it happens tenfold. Oh, <laughs> you know, we need more of that of what you're doing. And uh, when you, when you're doing the hip hop film, um, when it's out, you should come back and let us. Oh yeah. yes. I would love that. It's a four part series for Netflix on oh, women oh. and hip hop. Um, it's really about um, the incomplete history of black womanhood in America explored mm. through women in hip hop, their lives and their music. So mm. it's really great. We're just, you know, hitting all the, all the themes, all the things. Can't wait to see who's um, in this. Oh, it's, <laughs> I can't say yet. <laughs> <laughs> but everybody you want to be in it is going to be in it. Oh, that's, that's going to be awesome. Long overdue, long mm. overdue. Well, thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you for having me. You're you're quite welcome. We are welcome back anytime. Um, and everyone should know that um, they can follow, they can find out more about what you're doing, stay in touch with what the film is doing um, at MrSoulMovie.com. Yes, and we're also on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter mm -hmm. at MrSoulTheMovie. Yeah. Check it out because actually the site has a lot of stuff up there that like I was watching music videos and 
clips. It was just a lot of stuff to just go up there and just sit there and, and just get lost in what was happening. So I highly recommend people go up there and check it out. Um, and I guess that's it for us. Um, this was a great show. I, I'm, I can't yeah. wait to edit it, actually. Um, <laughs> Don't Thank edit you. It. That's the whole thing. Yeah, no, <laughs> let's keep going. This is 24 hours a day. Let's okay. keep it going. <laughs> um, thank you. And uh, I am Darren Jenkins. I'm Aqua Majid. And this was 12 million. Thanks, everyone. Talk to you soon. Thank you.